Hello friends, this video on principles of inheritance part 17 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. Now, based on these observations, let us try to understand Mendel's experiment that what exactly was happening in the experiment. So basically what did Mendel do? He crossed between parents that differed in two traits and that is why it was a dihybrid cross. Di means two, hybrid means heterozygote that is to form something by combining homozygous stuffs so that is hybrid so dihybrid cross so what he did he took homozygous round and yellow seeds and crossed them with homozygous wrinkled and green seeds so what happened so this was the parental generation now the next step was gamete formation. So how was, what were the possible gametes that could form from here? The gametes that can, the only possible gamete that can form from here is round seed which is yellow in color. So round that yellow seed. Now please remember that here you cannot form a gamete like R. Only R is not possible because here you are considering both the shape and the color of the seed. So to define a gamete it should have one letter to define the shape, it should have one letter to define the color. So RY is the only possible gamut here. Similarly, if you talk about this, the only possible gamut that, uh, that this can form is small r, small y. So these are the possible gametes. So for F1 generation, these two will combine together to form capital R, small r, capital Y, small y. So that is now since capital R is dominant and capital Y is dominant, therefore the F1 generation will all be round and yellow. So this is the F1 generation. Right? So now, this F1 generation again need to produce their gametes for F2 generation. So in F2 generation, what was done for F2? For F2 generation, this capital R, small r, capital Y, small y, that means basically this was heterozygous. So even though it was round, that phenotype of this and this was the same, phenotype, but genotype was different. So here this was heterozygous, right? If this has a heterozygous genotype, but this had a homozygous genotype. So that was the difference. Now, when this was crossed again, so basically now what was done? The F1 generation, they were self-crossed. So they were crossed amongst each other. So in that case, what are the possible gametes that can be produced? So now from one of these, so this can produce how many gametes? So one possibility is it can be capital R, capital Y. So it can have round seed, yellow in color. It can also have round seed, green in color. It can also have green seed, I mean, wrinkled seed, yellow in color, it can also have wrinkled seed and green in color. So these are the four possible gametes that can be formed from this, this heterozygous. Now how come here you are getting four possible gametes? Now these four possible gametes are possible because they are all segregating independently. For example, you see capital R, if you, if you only talk about the shape of the seed, the shape of the seed can be round or wrinkled, right? So round and wrinkled are getting segregated independently, correct? Similarly, the color of the seed can be yellow or green. So yellow and green are also getting segregated independently and they, they do not depend on each other. I mean, it, it is not necessary that capital R always has to be with yellow. I mean, it is not necessary that yellow color always has to be with round or round color always has to be with green. So there is no such compulsion. So they are all segregating independently. And that is why we are getting four gametes. Now, this was Mendel's experiment. Right now, I am talking only about Mendel's experiment. But later on, it was found I mean, down the years later, scientists found out with some other experiment that there are some genes which are linked together and they always remain together. They do not get segregated. So that is a different story altogether which we will take up later. But for now, whatever Mendel studied was that they all segregated independently. And similarly, from this also, you could get four gametes and they were capital R, capital Y, capital R, small y, small r, capital Y, and small r, small y. So these were the gametes which could be produced from the parents of the F1 generation. 
Now, using these gametes, what we will do, we have to find out the F2 generation. Now, here, since the number of gametes is more, so finding out F2 generation is going to be a little tedious. Like, what we have to do is basically this can combine with this, this can combine with this, like this can combine with this, this can combine with this. So, that is how we have to do it for all of them. So, that is going to be a little tedious and it is going to be a little cumbersome as well. So, that is why we will see here that how Punnett square becomes so easy in such cases. For monohybrid cross, I already told you that how we designed Punnett square. So, for Punnett square, all we need to know is the gametes. So, if we know both the male and the female gametes, it is very easy to design a Punnett square. So, here we will design a Punnett square. So, now that we know the gametes, let us quickly design the Punnett square. So, as we know in a Punnett square, what do we do? We uh, write down the male gametes and the female gametes on the topmost row and on the leftmost column. So, let us quickly do that. So, these are the gametes. So, we will just first write down all the gametes. So, now once you have written all the gametes, now it is very easy to make the combinations which will give you somewhat like this. Now, here you can understand the significance of having a colored square. Now, if you have, if you would have tried to do it manually, in that case, there were chances that you could have missed a quite a few of the combinations. But if you are using a Punnett square, it makes things easy. And also, I mean, you can be sure that you haven't missed out anything. So this is how you are going to draw the Punnett square. So once you have the Punnett square, then you can actually uh, decide how many of the outputs are going to be round and yellow, how many of the outputs are going to be round and the green and so on and so forth. So here if you see, this table actually gives, gives you the all possible outcomes of F2 generation. So the genotypes are all there. Now let us try to find out the phenotypes. So if you see, if I ask you, how many of these are round and yellow? So, how many are going to be round and yellow? So, let us just mark them. So, round and yellow. So, for any of the genotypes to be round, they should just have capital R because capital R is dominant over small r. Similarly, yellow capital Y is dominant over small y. So, wherever you have a capital R and a capital Y, they are going to be round and yellow. So, this is one. This is another. This is yet another. You have a capital R and capital Y. This is another one. Again, here you have capital R, capital Y, but here you don't have. Here you have capital R, capital Y. Again, you have it here, capital R, capital Y. And where else do you have? Here also you have capital R, capital Y. And then you have it here. So that, that's all where you have capital R, capital Y. So all of these are going to be round and yellow. So how many do you have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So total, if you see in the Punnett square, total 9 of them are round and yellow. Right? So now the next one is round and green. So how many of them are going to be round and green? So for round and green, you should have a capital R. But in order to be green, you should have two small y. So wherever you have one capital R and two small y, it is going to be round and green. So one such scenario is this one. So this is going to be round and green. Again, one capital R and two small y. This is also going to be round and green. Again, where do you have? This is one capital R and two small y. So these are the three uh, places where you will have round but green. So all these three are round and green. So they are three. Similarly, if you try to see how many are wrinkled and yellow. So for wrinkled, you should have two small y and for yellow, you just one capital Y is enough. So it's two small r, two small r and one capital Y. So here if you see two small r and capital Y. So this is going to be wrinkled and yellow. Again, here you have two small r and one capital Y. This is also wrinkled and yellow. Again, two small r and one capital Y. This is also wrinkled and yellow. So three, again, you have wrinkled and yellow. And finally, how many do you have which are wrinkled and green? 
So for that you are just left out with one. So you just have one which is wrinkled and green. So if you look at the phenotypic ratio, so basically this will give you the phenotypic ratio because you have four unique phenotypes. These are the four phenotypes, round yellow, round green, wrinkled yellow and wrinkled green. So the phenotypic ratio of F2 generation so the phenotypic ratio of the F2 generation is going to be 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. Now what about the genotypic ratio? If you want to find out the genotypic ratio, yes, of course you can do that. But that is going to be a little more tedious because you have a lot of unique genotypes. So if you see here, you have almost uh, some 10 unique genotypes. See, this is one unique genotype. It, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Right? So if you actually try to look at the various genotypes, so what are the various genotypes that you have? Capital R, capital R, capital Y, capital Y. How many of it exists? One. Similarly, capital R, capital R, capital Y, small y. How many exists? Two. Again, small r, small r, small y, small y. How many exists? Again, one. Again, if you see, how many more exists for two? So here you can see, for capital R, small r, capital Y, small i, small y. For this, it exists four. So like that, you can actually find out how many exists for each of the unique genotypes. And you will see that you will come up with a ratio somewhat like 1 is to 2 is to 1 is to 2 is to 4 is to 2 is to 2 is to 1 is to 1. Because you actually have that many unique genotypes. So that is how you can find out the genotypic ratio. So maybe you can do that yourself just to check if you are able to find out the unique genotypes. So basically this is how a Punnett square actually helps when things become with the cross is complicated. So I hope that now you know how exactly you have to find out that how what will be the result of a particular cross, how do you find phenotypic ratio, genotypic ratio. So this is how Mendel performed this dihybrid cross. But from this, what was the new thing that he observed? So one thing that this helped him is he could actually confirm his principle of dominance and the principle of segregation. He felt that okay, those two principles are right because they are even followed by a dihybrid cross. Thank you. Please visit www.examfear.com to watch more videos, attempt free online test, get free study material, Find tutors and mentors. Thank you once again.